But about the writers in England, let, let me explain something because about this beginning, from the beginning and so on. Um, most of us had been writing before the short stories and so on. But um, when I'm asked, uh, how did you go to England and why? I, I usually uh, say as an immigrant, because the truth is that um, I remember very well the boat that I went on, and we went to England by boat in those days. We didn't go to England by plane. In, 19, uh, in 1950 was when I went to England, and you went by boat. Um, it took about two weeks or something like that. Everybody, it's only around about 1959, 60 that the plane thing started, but you went by boat. Um, and there were, I would say, um, there were only two categories of people going to England, two categories. Um, one, a very tiny, very tiny minority, five or six students. These are people who got some kind of scholarship or fellowship or whatever it is and so on. All the rest, as far as I was concerned, were immigrants. That is, immigrants meaning that there were, many of them were unskilled workers, just looking for that something would happen. What I later called in an essay, a journey to an expectation. Nobody knew what was going to happen. But you expect that when you arrive. And in those days, once you had a, a passport that was called um, a Barbados passport, which said that you were a subject of the sovereign, whoever the sovereign was. I think it was the king in 1950 and thing. That gave you free entry. You had no visa, no nothing at all. Once you had subject of and so on, you had all the rights of entry. Very much like Puerto Rico could go into, into the, the United States. So I said that I, I was an immigrant because the, the fact is that we, whatever expectations we had, we were really all going, and most of us didn't know whom we were going to either, or where we were going to live. This is one of the extraordinary adventures. Um, and I traveled with Selvan. Selvan was with me. Selvan and I became very, very close friends. We traveled together as immigrants but saying we were writers. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually said this, for example, on the immigration card, would you have written uh, writer? I don't remember any card. I didn't write anything. <laughs> well, we had to actually, write nothing at all. No, 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 no. Oh, no, no. If I had to put down uh, occupation, it would be writer. No, 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 no. Okay. But you couldn't put immigrant on it. You have yes, to put okay. something. Uh, carpenter, whatever it is, and so on. But what I'm saying is that that, that was a, a, a migrant. That was a, I regard the, 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 the writers of the generation as part of the migration movement. And they were, in fact, uh, why I say they were part of the migration movement, because although they were going to be writers, uh, Selvan hadn't published. Selvan had about, Selvan had about, two chapters or something of A Brighter Sun. It wasn't, it wasn't finished and so on. So they, they, were, they were, you know, it was just kind of expectation. But Selvin would have thought of himself quite correctly as a writer, and that's why he was going to England and so on. Um, um, he wouldn't very boldly say that to whoever asked, I mean, because writer, I don't know, something. A writer didn't look like these fellows. There's, there's something else about being a writer. Usually they're dead to begin with. Uh, and then you were in this hostel where there had nowhere to live. The British Council used to have hostels for people who may not know where to sleep when they arrive. And, uh, and, and, and they had, uh, the British are fascinating in this way. They had British Council representatives down at the boat station that when the, uh, the train arrived, Anybody who looked lost, they would question. If you look lost and manageable, not, not just lost, <laughs> but lost and manageable, uh, they would question and so on. And you said, well, well I'm, uh, some are fixed, I'm a student. Uh, um, not to show you at the school I'm going to, but, right. but I'm a student and so on. 
all kinds of remarkable fabrications uh, were made in China. And you went to this uh, hostel, a very famous, called the Balmoral, and some very interesting stories are set um, in the Balmoral Hostel. And they would give you, in the Balmoral Hostel, they gave you a month. You paid rent, and rent then, it's, I don't know, it was something like, uh, I don't know, probably it was, was 10 shillings a week or something like that. It's crazy, I mean, when you think about it, absolutely crazy. But after a month, it, it, it was expected that during that period you would have found, the month was to help you find somewhere to live and uh, also find uh, some means of paying the rent uh, wherever you were, were going to live and so on. All of, most of us, the, the ones that became writers and so on. There are a whole lot of other chaps. I don't know what happened, uh, where they're connected. In some cases, you would, you would have uh, situations where um, there are West Indians who had been living there for some time, who would go down to Waterloo, to the station, to see if they knew anybody who had arrived. And sometimes that guy would put up somebody and so on. You, you, you had that looking after, looking after. So they had a guy who was called, his name was Nunez, and who became, he's Moses in Sam's Lonely Londoners. And Moses is the one who anybody in trouble was sent to Moses. Moses had been around there. Because Moses is the guy from time to time who at the station took you to his basement flat and Moses would put you up for a week you know, or two weeks or until you found a job and so on. It's a remarkable kind of, uh, of generosity. And that's how they, they spread out and so on. If you wanted to find out what had become of A or B or C, who had come up with you and so on, we discovered that there was one place where you could find that out. A Jamaican barbershop. There was a Jamaican who had a barbershop around Marble Arch. And uh, most West Indians living around there went to Jamaica because you didn't risk your head with any white man. It, 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 there's no way, I've never known any West Indian go to an English barber. That was completely out of the question. So there weren't very many in the days, but they, I've forgotten his name. Uh, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, because I don't remember all my books, there's a considerable section in the immigrants in the barber shop. A lot of the exchanges of what happened and what became of who and who and so on goes on in a chapter in this. That's straight out of the, out of the uh, Jamaican barbershop. Those two categories of student and immigrant, and, and the immigrant fell into all kinds of classifications. Uh, they, some of the immigrants did in fact become uh, uh, writers. Some got a job in the civil service and, and remained there and so on. For the first two weeks, and um, uh, in order to pay the rent, a week passed and nothing, another week, you're just going around looking at things and so on. And then there was a factory uh, saying that they wanted hands and I went to find out what, what this was about. I'd come up in a very idiotic education that I was supposed to work with a desk and so on. So I went into this factory and found out what they wanted me to do in this. It was a factory called Firestone. And Firestone made these big tires and so on. And they said, what do you have to do? What do we want you to do? You see those tires up there? We want you to roll, roll those tires from up there, over there, and down from these. So what else? Nothing else. That's what you, that you, just, you just roll those tires down there. And, so, and they meant to roll the, I could roll the tires there. I saw men rolling. Some men can roll two, three tires at a time. I tried with two and decided uh, one went in one direction, one <laughs> went in the other. And I said, you better stay put <laughs> with, the, Roll one with the one. So I, and that got me. And I only lasted a week because and it was really uh, very, very tricky because my tire got away too and rolled over and nearly fell on a worker below. And they thought that they had enough of me and so on. So this was my solitary experience as a manual laborer 
uh, in England after 30-something <laughs> years. And so on. There are people who, who write, but would be um, very reluctant to say, I, I'm a writer, and, and so on. That, you know, uh, they do it on the side and sometimes quietly, and so on. And there are people who write, and among, they usually have a circle. And um, within that circle, they're writers. There's no question about that. They're writers. Now, this question is very important because I left out something. Before England, I went from Barbados to Trinidad. Okay? This is a very critical, what people call defining moment and so on. And what I discovered in Trinidad that I never had in Barbados and so on, there was something called the Readers and Writers Guild. And this was a group of people who met once a month. Whoever felt that they could write submitted things to this thing, and they decided that they was going to uh, read this month and be this month and so on. And then there was this open discussion. South One was a part of that group. Middle Hudson was a part of that group at one stage. And, and before I had written anything, you could also go and listen, and I have gone and listened to that. So actually, uh, any one of those men in there would have said that they are writers. This would may not have any meaning to anybody outside of there, but it had tremendous meaning to them. And it got meaning established, because this is when you could call yourself a writer, if you had got something printed. Okay, so that's the and this was the importance of BIM. Everybody in there had had something printed in BIM. Okay, including and yourself. Including myself. My, but mine had started very early, if it would come to that from school. But, but Middle Hotsu was in BIM, Selvan was in BIM, there was a whole number of them. Because BIM was where you went to, there was nothing else to go to. That was the significance of BIM. And apparently once you were in BIM, you had earned the right to say that you were right. If people asked you, where have you written? And uh, you would say, if you go around, and you'll see a copy of something, and so on. So you got that status, and so on, uh, of story. Of course, that was heightened if it then became a book. But there is a, there is a stage from BIM on. Um, from 1948, I think it was, the BBC carried a very special program called Caribbean Voices on the BBC Overseas Service. And this is a very odd arrangement. It's very much like the sugar. Um, West Indian writers were um, invited to submit um, stories and poems to, be, to the BBC, to Caribbean Voices. These were selected, and then these were read back to the Caribbean audience. You know, it's as though you sent, you plant sugar, you sent sugar to England, and then they send back sugar to you. And this, this was significant. This was very, very important. So that you would find that most of the stuff, not all, but most of the stuff between 1949, 1950, 1951, most of the stuff that you hear on the Caribbean Voices appeared in BIM. Or you, it appeared in BIM, and then you heard it on Caribbean Voices, or you, it appeared in Caribbean, heard on Caribbean, and appeared in, that then became a very close kind of collaboration between Collymore as the editor of BIM, and Henry Swansea, a very famous name in Caribbean literature, Henry Swansea was the editor of, uh, of Caribbean Voices. Now, Caribbean Voices started to assume an even more prestigious thing than BIM. First of all, it was coming from the BBC. That is very heavy, very, very heavy. Caribbean Voices was then not only heard um, BIM may get out of Barbados sometimes, but we didn't know whether. But Caribbean Voices was heard right across, uh, uh, right, right across the region and in West Africa, that, 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 that service. So you had some notion of, of an audience that was becoming international, uh, which you couldn't quite claim for BIM. But the other important thing, too, because you're not really a writer until you start getting money for writing, Caribbean Voices paid. Uh, Bim Colomer racked his brain 
one way or the other to see how he could from sales, how he could divide up sales. And I was, uh, if you knew Colomer, you'd see him sometimes on a Saturday morning, he kept an account of every sale, of every sale, of every sale. And you, I, his letters would be very interesting. He would be sending me, I'd then receive, you know, he'd send, you know, I think we have for you uh, $5. <laughs> for whatever was the contribution coming out of the He was very meticulous in keeping the book about the sales and so very meticulous about that and very meticulous about informing the writer that this was his share of what had come uh, from the sales. I